Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at Richard Vobes, or as I like to call him, the BS Explorer. Richard has some questionable characters on his show quite often, and I truly believe that Richard doesn't understand he's quite STEM illiterate. If you see this, Richard, don't take that in offence. It's actually a lot of my friends are STEM illiterate. It's just a term, and as we watch this video, that term is probably going to be used quite a lot because I've watched this through and I'm, uh, I'm shocked, to be perfectly honest. Richard has two guests. The guests claim they are pilots who have come across... The Conspiracy Theory in the Sky. Right, so without further ado, let's get on with this and let's see what these pilots have to say. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me in another of my wonderful interviews. Now, as you know, on this channel, we've been talking about the stuff they've been doing in the sky. These are pilots. Now, they want to keep their identity naturally uh, hidden. Uh, for obvious reasons. They work within the industry and they know what's going on, but they are prepared to speak. And this is a chance for you and I to find out a little more about the real murky world of the chemtrails, the climate engineering. First of all, I'd like to introduce Eve. Hello, Eve. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Eve. I am a commercial pilot. I have been for just over 25 years. Uh, I flew 10 years in freight and then uh, the rest of 15 years on business jets and so I have uh, extensively travelled all around Europe, uh, America, Canada, the Middle East and uh, as far as Singapore and I'm based in Frankfurt and my original country is Belgium. Thank you very much Eves. And uh, the second pilot who we're going to talk to is Russ. Hello Russ. Hello Richard, uh, thanks for having us on your show. I'm Russ. I've had a lifetime in aviation, starting off firstly in the military. Then I moved on to commercial flights, which include passengers and cargo. And currently I'm working in the private sector, uh, both the UK and into Europe. Who would like to kick off with um, what, they're, what, what they're spraying and, and perhaps why? Uh, yes, I can answer that, uh, Richard. Um, so what they're spraying, uh, we've uh, all around Europe, we have had uh, tests done from the dust on your car, from the dust on roofs. And uh, I've noticed the chemtrails personally for about the last 10 years. Uh, so they have been tested. So we have had many samples tested uh, from various laboratories where they have um, mass spectrometers and the main constituents are barium, strontium, aluminium oxide. Uh, the first two are carcinogenic. Aluminium oxide promotes Alzheimer's disease amongst other things. And uh, there are various microplastics uh, up to 2% uranium and uh, graphene oxide. Okay, so strontium, barium, 2% uranium. So what we're about to see is the reaction of strontium in water. Uh, strontium is a group 2 um, element on the periodic table. It's, it reacts with water a lot faster than calcium, but slower than barium, the other basically element that they're saying is inside this um, stuff there, misting, chemtrail, whatever. So we're about to see what happens to strontium in water. Um, strontium is actually found um, in river water and seawater as well. I think uh, seawater is about 8 parts per million and river water is about 50 parts per billion. But regardless... If this is inside um, some kind of fluid, which is clearly water, right? Because that's what the chemtrails mainly are. That's coming out the back of these aircraft. We can't have strontium in. We can't have barium in. 
because they both react exactly the same. Bariums are slightly slower, but that's producing hydrogen gas and strontium hydroxide. Where does that gas go? If that's a sealed container, that's a, a, a hydrogen explosive, gas, hydrogen gas explosive, not nuke, <laughs> but gas explosive. So all that hydrogen gas is going to build up. It only takes one spark. It's it, hydrogen gas. Just friction is is enough to ignite it. It's a really, really. I mean, the Hindenburg, for instance. <laughs> So this is a uh, barium. Um, barium again, another group two um, element on the periodic table. And you'll notice that is not water. That fluid, it's in there. And again, that's barium in water, producing loads and loads of hydrogen and hydroxide gas. So yeah, there's no way that there could be water and these two heavy metals together. Impossible. And heavy metal is another thing we're going to get to right now with the periodic table. Okay, let's move on. Right, so this is our periodic table. Okay, so before we get into strontium, barium and uranium, because apparently that's in there, right? 2%, whatever the hell, 2% of what? Fuel rod, enrichment or depleted uranium, whatever the hell that is, we're going to look at, obviously, the atomic weight of air molecules. So we have an atomic mass of 15, nitrogen is 14, and for the little that is around, apart from the bonds in water, is hydrogen is obviously one of the lightest element. Cool, I'm not going to do carbon because it you know, four parts per million, um, yeah, oh sorry, 400 parts per million, <laughs> or 4%, I should have said, um, it's not, it's not, you know, you, you're not going to bother, I mean, oxygen's like 20%, isn't it, and nitrogen fills the rest of that uh, void, so yeah, and obviously there's other gases as well, and argon, and all kinds of stuff, but we're not going to get into that, there's no point in going there, it's not worth it. Okay, so let's look at the lightest element, which is going to be strontium. Or should I say the lightest of these three very heavy metals. So strontium has an atomic mass of 87. So in air, it's going to sink, right? It's not going to stay suspended. I mean, even if we take you know, two hydrogen and one oxygen and make water, that's still, what, like 20, call it, let's square it at 30. So that has an atomic mass of 30 in comparison to 87. But that's the lightest one. Strontium is heavier. So let's look at barium then. 137, so we're getting heavier, right? As we move through the second tier of the periodic table, or the group two elements. So obviously now we have a uranium, which is 238. Now think about this, these heavy metals, right? They're gonna even, let's, let's take away the fact that, you know, they're really, really reactive with water. Let's take that off the table. Uh, so we've got a level, level playing field now, I'm gonna say, Okay, the bottom of that tank is literally where all these heavy metals are going to live if they're suspended either in a gaseous form or a liquid form. Regardless of what that liquid is, they can never, ever, ever be buoyant in that liquid. So they're just going to settle down on that surface. Now, you know, these are quite reactive metals and they react with other metals as well. What's to say that they don't react with what the tank's made of? Plus as well, let's put them back on the table now, was generating a fuck ton of hydrogen gas and breaking down inside that liquid. Where does that hydrogen gas go? Isn't this now just a flying bomb? Just the, the friction of something, just, you know, two metal components rubbing together in the winglet, or the, the uh, wing spar, sorry. That could ignite the, this hydrogen that's escaping everywhere. If that hydrogen's not allowed to escape from that tank... That tank's going to explode because that hydrogen gas is going to build up and up and up. 
And whatever that material is made out of, it's, it's eventually going to overpressure because this metal now has gone from a extremely dense metal to a gaseous mass. And that density of its, its actual atomic mass in within the bonds of that metal that it formed has now been released. Well, by releasing those bonds and this now becoming a gaseous mix and hydroxide, that is a considerable amount of energy. I mean, you know, you, you barium, it's, uh, come on, you, hang on, why is it still uranium? Come on, barium, thank you. <laughs> well, that's not happened there. But your, your barium is 137, that's atomic mass of 137. All that mass is going to be converted, well, most of that mass is going to be converted now into, into gas. All that, and to do that, that's, that's a, a hell of amount of energy released. You know, there's a crazy amount of energy. So, that's going to be a flying bomb, for a start. Now, let's go back to uranium. All around the UK, the world, America, Russia, China, France, everyone, has radiological sensors, right, that test the atmosphere for nuclear weapons releases. Or should I say the emissions, the, the 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 nuclear dirty stuff that comes out of say uranium or plutonium explosion, and these are on all the time. And not just that, ports have them. So points of entry, points of entry to your country have them, like airports, seaports, hospitals have them because they have radiological materials on site. They you know they can have like strontium ninety, cobalt sixty, and um, cesium one three seven, and they need to have sensors on site in case one of those machines gets damaged and there's a release of that um, radioactive source from, say, a scanning ma machine or some kind of X-ray machine or something like that. Then they need a way to detect that release of source because you don't want a lot of people a week later coming back in with you know necrosis and holes in the skin and stuff and they've got no bone marrow left. So the, the, all these places have sensors. And yeah, nah, if... Uranium is coming out the back of an aircraft, right? It's bells and whistles. It's, it's cities evacuated. I mean, literally everyone from the city evacuated. You know, emergency broadcasts, stay indoors. At it, 2%, I don't care what it is, I don't care whether it's depleted or whatever, at 2%, that is a bad, bad day on planet Earth, I'm telling you now. And regardless of what you may think... Oh, or what you believe, I'm sorry, that is not being released in whatever form that is, or from spent fuel rods to in highly enriched weapons grade uranium, or just reactor at eight percent enriched uranium. But they just caught. They say it's two percent uranium. Is that two percent enriched, or is that two percent by volume of an uranium, uranium ore, or you know, is it spent fuel? What is it? I mean, and if it is spent fuel, then what's it decaying to? If it's spent fuel, then it'll contain cesium-137, cobalt-60, the strontium-90, the, the nasty strontium one, the, the one that says, if you see me running, or do not drop written on the casing around it, if, you know, drop and run, basically, written on the case, if you drop it, run away from it, that's strontium-90, it'll contain that if it's spent fuel. It's not going to be depleted uranium that's um, designed for battlefield penetration weapons because they literally go straight from where they're milled straight to the military and get stored. So it's not that. So what is it? What's 2%? Why is it 2%? Okay. Right, so let's move on then. And let's see what else they've got to say, shall we? Yes, and this has been going we know from at least the 1940s but i've had reports that, that that hot air balloons were sort of mucking about with weather testing in the 1880s or something contaminants in the fuel uh we dismissed that to begin with because we thought the hot section of the engine will just melt everything but in actual fact what they're putting into the fuel uh, it has a higher melting point of around about 900 degrees and hot engines, uh, hot sections of the engines tend to burn at around seven to 800 degrees. So the fuel in the combustion chamber is up to 2000 degrees Celsius. Um, so HARP 
uh, which I think everybody has now heard about. Uh, there are various sites around the world. Uh, this is high frequency, but it's they're using thousands of watts. So it does affect the ionosphere and having the metal particulates in the uh, ionosphere already. This is our harp calculus here. So we basically have harp, which they said was kilowatts. Um, it's not. It's actually 3.6 megawatts at full power. Not that they run it at that, but let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Let's say full power, 3.6 megawatts. And then basically this is our distance here, squared to the ionosphere. So this is the power density in milliwatts per square centimetre at the ionosphere, 0 0.00003 milliwatts per square centimetre at the ionosphere. Okay, so let's say this harp is aiming for the clouds. So let's say a low cloud layer, uh, say, let's go for, let's go for 7,000 meters. Even then, it's still half a watt per centimeter squared, or 584 milliwatts per centimeter squared. That power density is not going to do anything. And HARP has a photon energy of 0 0.00000003 electron volts. So it's not going to ionize anything. The amplitude of the wave or magnitude of the wave at 0 0.5 watts is not going to start basically interacting with water molecules and making them flex their dipoles and spin the dipoles and cause what your microwave oven at home would do to a glass of a beaker of water but that but even a thousand watts is 200 millimeters away from that beaker and it's at a higher frequency anyway of obviously 2.4 gigahertz whereas this from harp is not harp's wavelength is 10 megahertz or approximately 30 meters long. So these are nano size metallic elements or particles. How is something that's 30 meters long going to interact with something that's nanometers? How? It's impossible. So we proved the wave magnitude is not powerful enough to start messing around with hydrogen and oxygen dipoles and we've also shown that the frequency or the, the length of the wave itself for Harp's frequency has not got enough electron volts to ionize. Ionization starts at 10 electron volts. This is to the negative power 10 of electron volts. It's not going to do it. Okay so we're going to go back to the periodic table now because they've just said something and I'll point that once we get there. Okay, so we're back in the periodic table now. Now, Eves, Yeves, or Jeeves, or whatever the hell they've called him to disguise his voice, mentioned that these elements, or these particles, float up to the ionosphere, right? So the aircraft is in the troposphere, right? That's where aircrafts fly, troposphere to stratosphere, that area. Well, the ionosphere is hundreds of kilometers above that area. So what we're going to look at is, again, the weight of the elements. So barium, right? Atomic mass 137. Strontium, atomic mass 87. Should we bother even doing uranium? But let's do it anyway. So uranium, atomic mass 238. Um, then we get to our air molecules. So nitrogen, right? Atomic mass of 14 and oxygen atomic mass of 15. And we're not going to bother with carbon, like we said before. It's a waste of time. It's not enough of it, especially at that altitude as well, because it's a heavier element. 
than these two, it's just going to flow down, which ironically, <laughs> this is what we're getting to now. So how are these defining the laws of physics with the uranium as well? How are they doing it? Because they are denser than the air molecules around them. So they are negatively buoyant. They are going to sink down. Just like if you threw a cannonball in a pond, it's going to sink. It's the same thing here. Because of their atomic mass, they are not buoyant, whereas what he is saying is that they are positively buoyant and they float up into the ionosphere and just hang around, just chill there, just, hey, Mr. 5G, hey, Mr. Harp, I want you to interrupt with me. Uh, no, that's not, it, that defies the laws of physics. You know, thermodynamics, even with a, a crazy amount of heat below it, it's going to go straight through it, whereas a crazy amount of heat below it would punch warm, moist air through the troposphere into the stratosphere like it does at the equator but in the case of this oh what should i mention actually uh, the convection cells right that's how they start you know massive amounts of hot plumes of air push through and then it makes a convection cell that's how that works but anyway tangent so these heavy elements no it even with like some crazy hot plume they're not going to get up there it's impossible even you know, the carbon atoms for CO2 wouldn't get up there. They'd fall straight through, regardless of how hot it is. That's why a lot of the time carbon puts out fires, because it sinks, right? Even though it's a hot fire, the CO2 sinks. It'll stay quite low. And that's right at the, you know, the, the, the magnitude and intensity of the infrared heat from the fire, and it still sinks. So what is barium and strontium and uranium going to do? They're going to sink like a cannonball in a swimming pool. That's what's going to happen. So it's bullshit. Those elements are not floating up to the ionosphere from the troposphere or any fucking fear, sphere even, whatever. They are not getting up there. It's impossible. Absolutely possible. I mean, aluminium, atomic mass 26, that's going to sink. That's not going to stay up there. It's ridiculous. Anyway, let's move on. How many operating uh, planes are operating in any one time? Well, it's very difficult to know the exact numbers, Richard, but through our investigation, it's clear that they tend to operate in a, a set pattern. That set pattern, you have to understand, is all controlled by international as well as the UK. Uh, um, Google is your friend? Traffic service. We also know that the, they are talking to the military operators. The National Air Traffic Service, NATS as it's called, um, both military and civil operators actually sit side by side in one control room. What happens is a flight plan would be... Oh, the, uh, the irony. <laughs> oh, well, it's hard to say, Richard, then. <laughs> Nats, they all sit together and, you know, he knows more about the inside of Nats than he does about something that's easily Googled. Well done, you. And then within a few minutes to a few hours, you'll see the sky just cloud over. And if you don't get the rain, you're lucky. But it, that's why we're suffering with this lack of it. Right, so there's an important note to take away from what you just said there. About the rain. The trails start, and then the rain comes. So it's water, isn't it? Right, so this is a latent heat of water calculation. So we know that one square centimetre column of water is approximately 590 calories. So what we've got here is we have, we know that a kilometre is a million centimetres, so a million centimetres by a million centimetres, and then we cube it by the depth of rainfall, we times that by the calories, and then we times that by the total area, which this is now 500 square kilometres by 2.5 centimetres. This is actually the rainfall that fell on Dubai. Um, it's not the entire area, it's actually bigger, that's so there'd be more energy, but this is the calories of that rainfall. 
7.3, we'll just round it to that, times 10 to the 17th power. That's 17 decimal places. That is a huge, colossal amount of energy. Right, so what we're going to do now, we're going to do this by magic. Right, by the magic of video editing, we are here. This is our final calculation to calculate the latent heat of water energy and its calories. Now, what we've done is we've made that divisible by e, well, 10 to the 15th. And that is the calorific energy of a one kiloton of TNT. So a one kiloton nuclear weapon. So we know the nuclear weapon at Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. So this is how many kilotons that small area in Dubai, when that weather system went through, has in basically Hiroshima sized bombs. Yep. 48,666 and a half Hiroshima sized bombs. That's 48, 48, basically 48 and a half thousand Hiroshima sized bombs. That's just a, a 500 kilometer square area. Yes, yeah, so there you have it. That is the latent water energy in terms of. Hiroshima size bombs and that's just a 500 square kilometer area the the weather system went through is, is way bigger but we just thought we'd give it a, a roughly UK low pressure system size area but that is a hell of a lot of energy now so what we're going to do now we're going to look at um, the output in calories from a aircraft okie dokie okay so this now is our aircraft we have 180,000 litres on board. We know that one litre of jet fuel will create a vapour of 1,230 millilitres of water. So every litre burnt generates that in vapour millilitres and we know that a milliliter a column is 590 calories so we can times it by that and obviously our latent heat or evaporation so then we can now divide that by our Hiroshima size bomb so again 15 times 10 to the 12th so an aircraft with all its fuel on board is the equivalent to 0 0.00087 Hiroshima bombs, so a fraction of a Hiroshima bomb. Now what we can do here is we can also say, well, this aircraft will be in the air, say, for 12 hours. So we can basically then just divide that into chunks of 12 and say it's over the UK, or Dubai, wherever, for an hour, it's now, it's energy, or it's ablative, uh, sorry, not ablative, it's latent heat of water, is now 0 0.000072. So this is the energy, in terms of kilotons, that it puts out in an hour. So, as we've seen before with the other calculation, it was 48,500 48 Hiroshima bombs. This one aircraft is now putting out 0 0.0007 of a Hiroshima sized bomb. But we can do better than that. We can say, all right, well, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. So, okay. Let's say, as we've seen on the NATS official website before, there's approximately, during a 24-hour period in the UK, there's 6,000 aircraft in the air in a 24-hour period. Now, we've seen that an aircraft hanging around for an hour, you know, was, was relatively weak, right? Like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0007, whatever it was. Okay, so what we can do now, then, we can go, well, we can times that by 6,000 aircraft. So 6,000 aircraft has the energy 
this is over a 24 hour period, don't forget, of 5.2 Hiroshima sized bombs. Right, well, what we can also do then, we can now divide that by, say, let's go for an average. Let's not say all these aircraft are traveling, you know, to, for 12 hours. Let's say these aircraft are in the air for, let's go, maybe a lot of long haul. So let's go eight hours. So divide that by eight. It's still half a Hiroshima sized bomb of fuel vapor put into the atmosphere. Now you've just seen that, and don't forget this is this is over a, a you know over a, a wide area. So I have been really fair with the maths here. I formed I think is a really fair average. I give it the full beans for the aircraft in the air, and it's still. 0 0.6 of a Hiroshima bomb. So let's be fair again. Let's say 8 kilotons. But that's over a 24 hour period from 6,000 aircraft. Well, you've just witnessed the Dubai, the water basically that landed in Dubai, or should I say the latent heat of the water that landed in Dubai, 2.5 centimeters cubed was 48,666 Hiroshima bombs in a, in a in a pretty, this is, again, that area I chosen, that 500 square kilometers, that is quite, I'd say that's quite fair, it's probably, you know, a good thousand square kilometers that was spread over. So, yeah, and that, that would have been double the Hiroshima bombs. But yeah, I'm sorry, no, that 500, 500 square kilometer area is about the size of a UK low pressure system. If this is over the UK, that is not going to create a UK low pressure system. A UK low pressure system is a magnitude higher. And let's be fair, how many low pressure systems do you see that are just, you know, all right, the water at 2.5 centimeters, that's quite high, but the low pressure system itself is only 500 square kilometers. Usually low pressure systems are thousands of square kilometers sometimes tens of thousands of square kilometers. The big ones that come in off the Atlantic, the storms, they're massive. But yeah, that's your energy in a 24 hour period from 6,000 aircraft. But that's over a 24 hour period. Ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And let's just, let's, you know what, let's just divide that by 24. 0 0.027 an hour. So that's probably, I'd say, a truck bomb, maybe? A large truck bomb of energy? It's not going to influence the weather, is it? It is not going to influence the weather. How is that the latent energy, that latent energy of water? How is that going to influence? Something that's, you know, megatons and megatons in terms of nuclear weapons of energy. It's not. Right then, let's get on with the video, shall we? Then they will fire up HARP or 5G or Doppler radar systems. That would manipulate the nanoparticles in those trails and hence they can control the weather and the jet stream accordingly. Right, okay, well, what we have here is a 5G, well, a 25 watts macro 5G cell. The big dildo looking things you see on the streets now, they're about 25 watts, um, but they do contain the micro and pico cells as well, which are like 10 watts and five watts. But this is like the LT Plus, the, the most powerful transmitter on there, which is usually about 3.6 gigahertz and like 2.8 gigahertz as well. So the power density for these, so we have a 25 watt cell. And then what we do again, we say four times pi times the distance squared. So this distance now is 7,000 meters. So this is going up to where clouds exist, right? like mid-level, or well, I suppose maybe low clouds, but it's gonna be the clouds it interacts with first. So we're giving it the best opportunity here to interact with clouds. 
and to interact with these chemtrails, allegedly. Well then, this is the far field power density of a 5G transmitter. So this is effectively the wave magnitude or amplitude of the wave. Obviously not the wavelength, but the wavelength itself is still 0 0.0004 electron volts. Again, we'll go back to what molecules ionize at, so or atoms even. So yeah, let's go down to the atomic level. So oxygen um, ionizes at about 14 electron volts, and that's pretty much across the board for anything you'll find in the atmosphere. There is things that ionize at like 5 electron volts, but they're like on the second tier of the periodic table, and they don't really exist in the atmosphere. But, it, you know, it, ionization starts at about 10 electron volts, and 14 is where like oxygen um, starts losing electrons. Prior to that, it just raises the energy of the electrons, and it, the, like all electrons do, they want to negatively charge all the time, so they just fall straight back down. So it can't ionize the molecules. It certainly can't ionize H2O molecules because they're like way, way, the, 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 you know, the hydrogen bonds and the dipoles are way stronger. I say microwaves, it's like 200 millimeters away from a thousand watt source at 2.4 gigahertz. You know, this isn't that. And yeah, 0 0.00004 milliwatts per square centimeter. That's 5G at 7,000 meters. Yeah, nah. And 5G, to be fair, this is kind of like um, a radar calculation. So um, 5G, with its shorter wavelength, give or take, but it's not going to give or take much. You might lose or gain a decimal place. That's all you're going to get. So that's it. I mean, if you put this into a online power density calculator, which you can do yourself, you might really want to do like 2.5 or something. Um, maybe take that down to 700 meters because it won't give you an output. The only reason why I'm getting an output here is because I'm using a scientific calculator. But you won't get an output on a power density calculator for that distance, for that wattage. Impossible. So yeah, there it is. That is the power density at 7,000 meters. It's uh, it's not going to happen, is it? And then when we factor in its uh, electron volts and its it's basically its frequency or the wavelength, it's it's not going to happen there either, because as I say, it's it's like one ten thousandth an electron volt, and to ionize um, its nearest air molecule is like one point four million times that. So, <laughs> yeah, nah. Stop talking bullshit. Um, typically, I saw uh, a very unusual aircraft, uh, which was out of base. It was a Delta aircraft, and uh, it was at Manchester Airport. Now, Delta, I know, do not fly into Manchester. And it was an Airbus A330. And I know full well, uh, as many people do, that there is a, an Airbus going around with the Delta livery and it's got Delta written underneath it and uh, with an American registration. Uh, we don't believe it's actually being operated by Delta, uh, but it was at Manchester and it was out of place. They don't fly there. And of course the excuse is given that, oh yes, it was a medical emergency and he'd, it was a diversion, a long haul diversion. So the crew were in the hotel. Well, well, that's funny because I flew from Manchester, EGCC, to Atlanta with Delta. I fly from Manchester and I could have flown from Manchester this afternoon but I've missed it. It's departed. Oh. Oh well. There's always tomorrow. So this is where we're going to conclude the video today. So therefore, we need an obvious conclusion. So my conclusion is that Richard understands that these guys aren't totally legit. It's hard not to. He clearly scripted the video, because 
when I did my first upload of this, I actually took it down because my head was swimming and it was late at night when I posted it and I didn't like it. It was it was good. It was all right, but I thought mm, no, no. So I took it down. I've, I've uploaded this one you're watching right now, and for him not to have a script or something telling him a iteration of what the conversation is going to be. I find that really hard to believe. So if Richard already had that in place, surely barium, uranium and all that was written in there. He could have Googled that and then come back with questions and said, well, look, guys, and you know, I've gone on YouTube and there's a video of barium breaking down in water. So what is in the mist? What's in the vapor? That never happened. So as I've proven today, the two pilots, their science doesn't stack up. The mass doesn't stack up. There's an inconsistency in their stories. And it's just all bullshit, isn't it? I could break this down till the cows come home, but I'm not going to. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and I shall catch you in the next one.